Um, okay, so I, we're happy here today to have uh, Kathleen Kohn from the Department of Mathematics from the Royal Institute of Technology, uh, KTH. Um, and um, uh, Kathleen will talk about the rational polypoles, um, uh, which are um, a nice example of positive geometries, which might be, for, for some of you who might be familiar from, uh, from physics, and uh, otherwise, um, it's very interesting to learn about them. Um, and also, I would like to say that for, for next time, uh, we will have in-person uh, seminars that are really hybrid. So for who is around Harvard, uh, will be free to join, and, uh, but they will also be available, of course, online uh, for people from around the world to, to join as well. Uh, so um, apologies again for the inconvenience, and um, we are uh, happy to have Kathleen start now. Thank you. Yes, so I will just try to be a little fast now, I think, so that people can go into the other things that they have to do. Um, so it's fine. So yes, I'm talking about rational polypoles. It's like a work with many co-authors, as you see here. And as I already said, in case someone joins since then, uh, I'd be happy to get interrupted with questions like anytime. And yeah, so just don't wait until the end. Just shout out if you are worried about something or want to know more about something. Okay, so let me start with uh, what is a polypole and so the motivation. Uh, for this was very different uh, from the positive geometry story. So there was Eugene Baxpress in uh, 1975 who wrote a nice book in which he um, uh, yeah, somehow sloppily defined polypoles to be closed planar figures bounded by gray curves. Um, but he actually wanted a little bit more conditions that I will get to later. So the easiest example is polygons. And uh, so he kind of wanted to see polypoles as a natural generalization of, of polygons. So, and an important class for him was so-called polycons, where you have um, these polypoles bounded by lines and conics. So here on the left is an example of a polycon uh, bounded by three ellipses. And, but there is also then more general polypoles, like here on the right, there's like a new example, this yellow triangular region that's bounded by two lines and the cubic curve. Right, and so why was Eugene Vaxpress interested in this? He was not an algebraic geometer nor a physicist, but like a geometric modeling person. Um, and he was interested to define the very central coordinates uh, that you know on syntheses and triangles. And he wanted to define those for arbitrary polytopes and also on these curvy regions called polypoles. Right. And so his central tool um, to be actually able to define such coordinates um, is the adjoint. And so this whole talk will essentially uh, center on this adjoint. And it's a very interesting object that. Uh, doesn't only appear here in these very central coordinate story, but it also appears, as we will see, as the numerator of the canonical form uh, when you think of polypoles as positive geometries. Um, it also appears as the numerator when you study uniform probability distributions on polytopes and uh, study certain generating functions. They also appear when you compute Segre classes of monomial schemes. So it's like an interesting object that appears at uh, many places. But let me just get started. So the outline today is that I will first define what these adjoints are and how you get very central coordinates from those. Then there is closely related um, a conjecture that is still open, so I want to advertise it. Um, it's widely open actually, and would be very important for geometric modeling. Namely, that this adjoint is um, strictly outside of your polytope or polypole in more generality. <clears throat> so this will then lead us to like the real algebraic geometry and the real topology of these curves. And yeah, and then so at the end, I want to make the connection between polypoles and uh, positive geometries. And I claim that in the plane, these are more or less the same. Uh, class of objects. Great. So as I said, if there's a question, just interrupt me. So here's now a formal definition of a polypole. Um, 
So for a polypole, I don't just allow any sort of semi-algebraic subsets of the plane because I want a similar property as I have for polygons that you have uh, cyclically your vertices and edges. So I have K irreducible boundary curves and K vertices. You know, and so like the vertex V12 is really on the intersection of the first two curves. And then you look at the next two curves and then you get a vertex and so on. So we want like cyclically ordered even boundary curves with the vertices and everything. Um, and then to make it nice and tractable with studying, we want to assume that the vertices uh, are smooth on the boundary curves and that the boundary curves meet transversely there. So the, they might be singular curves and they might not intersect transversely everywhere, but they should meet nicely at the vertices. So the basic example I said is uh, polygons, but there is more complicated objects as we saw in the previous slides. I already talked about this. You have like vertices, which are here the green points uh, in this picture. And then there is orange points in this picture, which are the outside intersection points of the, the boundary curves. There's all the, if you consider all pairwise intersections of the boundary curves, <clears throat> then some of those will be vertices, but not all of them. Plus also that the boundary curves might have singularities, as I said. Um, and so these singularities should also be part of these uh, orange points that uh, I will call residual points. Any questions so far, is that clear? So I wanna consider the singularities and pairs and dissections of the boundary curves. Some of them will be vertices and all the others are the residual points. And so as the title of this slide says, um, we're studying rational polypoles, not just arbitrary ones. And so a polypole is called rational uh, if all these boundary curves are rational curves. And it's actually interesting that this was Buck's best motivation to study these rational guys, but it's also exactly the class um, that we need for positive geometries in the plane, as it turns out. Okay, so now let me define this uh, mysterious edge joint. So it's easiest to understand for polygons. So the edge joint curve of a polygon is the unique curve of minimal degree that passes through all these outside intersection points. So these residual points. Here's like two cute examples. So what you do if you have a polygon, you extend all the edges until you get infinite lines. And then you see new intersection points of the lines appearing. Um, and then the edge of curve is the minimal degree curve that goes through there. So for a quadrangle, you get uh, two more outside points of the edge and line. And then uh, for pentagon, you get five points on the outside and you get a conic. So in general, the degree of this edge joint is the number of vertices minus three, which might be familiar from the adjunction formula. If you know that, if you don't know that, then it doesn't matter. Right, and so now you can show this also in general. So this is a theory that was more or less, I mean, it was known by Waxpress in the seventies. Uh, he was just not an algebraic geometer, so he did not give a very formal proof of this. So now what we did is we proved this formally. So when you have a polypole that has these rational curves and, and the, the nicest possible assumptions, like if all curves only have nodes as singularities and to meet transversely everywhere, then there's a unique curve of minimal degree that passes through these outside residual intersection points. And so you can also see again what the degree of this curve is and we call it the edge joint. So if you have all these strong assumptions, nodal curves that meet transversely, it's very easy to prove actually, but this theorem is also true if you drop these assumptions. So the only thing you really need for this theorem to be true is the property that the curves have to be rational, which is again, I find this very mysterious. It's, I mean, it's not really mysterious, but it's also the property you need for positive geometries. So let me look at these examples again from my title slide more or less. Um, 
So here on the left, you know, I have this uh, polypole that's coming from three ellipses that pairwise meet in four points, but three of the points are vertices in total. So you have nine outside points. And uh, so there is a unique cubic curve passing through these nine points. And on the right hand side, we have this other triangular shaped guy bounded by two lines and a cubic curve. And the lines meet the cubic curve always in three points, of course, but now I have some vertices. So I get some four orange intersection points of lines with the cubic, but the cubic also has one node, a singularity. Right? And so that's part of my outside points. So I get that's my five orange points on the right picture. And now if I have five points in the plane, there's a unique conic. So the adjoint, here is the picture. The adjoint on the left is this beautiful cubic and on the right is this nice conic. Right. And as I said, like you can also prove the same theorem from the previous slides. Um, if you only, as long as you only require the boundary curves to be rational, you always get a curve of minimal degree that uh, passes through these residual points, but now you might um, require some multiplicities if you have more complicated similarities. Okay, so this was somehow the story of Max Press adjoint and polypoles. Now, before I dive into the physics world, that might be more interesting for the audience here, I want to remind everyone what various and coordinates are. So here is a triangle. Um, and what you do if you want to compute the coordinates of the point Q in the middle of the triangle is that you subdivide the triangle uh, into three sub triangles, right? And then the very central coordinates, one for each vertex, is just the relative area of these um, three sub triangles. And so in geometric modeling, there is a definition of how very centric coordinates should look like also on more complicated objects like polytopes or even more complicated. So here's the definition state for polygons. So a, a set of functions is very centric coordinates. If so, these functions should first of all be well defined on the interior of your object, you want to be able to evaluate it everywhere on the interior of your polygon. And you want to have a function for each vertex, right? Because you want to just use the vertices of your polygon to write points inside the polygon. And some of the natural axioms for barycentric coordinates are that first of all, these functions should be strictly positive everywhere. This should sum to one, but I mean, that's just important uh, for you because you want some sort of reasonable normalization. And the important property is this part C. And the property C just says that, I mean, every point in the interior you want to be able to express with these coordinates. So you want to have like a weighted sum over your vertices. And the coefficients are the, the functions. So that's the generally agreed upon set of axioms of what barycentric coordinates are. And you can actually show it. So these three axioms, A, B, C, they uniquely determine the barycentric coordinates that you all know from high school on triangles. But there's not true for other polygons, by the way. So uh, if you have an arbitrary polygon, there is many sets of functions that will uh, allow this definition. And Vaxpress just gave one way of defining functions that are very central coordinates on polygons. And they are actually used in applications, uh, finite element methods and so on, but there's also other coordinates, as I said, um, that are also used. They have different advantages and disadvantages. If you're interested in this, I can recommend a nice survey article about different very central coordinates. And let me focus on the ones defined by Max Express. So now we are focusing on convex polygons in the plane that are defined by lines and vertices. And um, I write small l uh, 
small li for the defining equation of the ith line. And uh, I write alpha for the defining equation of the adjoint curve, okay? And now let me give you this technical definition of these Wax press coordinates. So as I said, these coordinates come in, in a, it's a set of functions. You have one function per vertex. And how does this look? So I want to see if I can actually try to write, do you see this? So may, may I ask a question? Yes. So, so wait, uh, I think I'm trying to understand. So how there are, uh, Okay, there are n different very centric uh, coordinates, right? Or how, how many are there then? Sorry, yes. I'm just uh, leading into my next question. Yes, so there is the set of very centric coordinates consists of one coordinate function for each vertex. Okay, so so you wrote V, sorry, uh, you wrote V, I, J, so uh, I and J <laughs> run over one to n. Right, uh, yeah. yes. I mean, I, I just wrote V, I, J because yeah. I want you same notation as for polypods, you know, so Vij is the vertex that lies on the intersection of the i curve with the right. j's curve, but they're just cyclically. I just have the curves one, two, three, four, five, and I have the vertices five in between. Okay, no, I was just uh, trying to see if there was a connection to the secondary polytope construction. Maybe not. I think there is some sort of connection. Like I tried to talk with, we should talk about this more, but now my mind is clouded from uh, being a mom. <laughs> It looks it looks quite similar to the construction. I mean, I mean, uh, the coordinates there are constructed from areas. But yeah. So anyway. Right. So I think in some sense, I was talking with Christian Hase about that there's like the different choices of uh, when you look at this X instead of uh, they should give like different yeah, if you, you can like also think of different points in the secondary polytope and like the vax coordinates are like a specific choice, but yeah, yeah, in any case. Right, right, okay, okay, very good. Yeah, thanks. Right, so let me shortly explain how these work. It, it doesn't, it's not as technical. I mean, you, if you guys are known to positive geometries, that's way more technical than this. So, so these very centric coordinates, um, here I want to define the one, do you see it if I do this on the screen? Do you see that I'm showing something on the screen? Looks good, good to me. Okay. So here is this vertex V12 that's green in the picture. And I want to define the barycentric coordinate corresponding to that vertex. Then what you do is you consider all the edges of your polygon that are not adjacent to that vertex. So in my picture, they are blue. So you consider it's the three blue edges not adjacent to the vertex. And the numerator of these barycentric coordinates is just the product of the linear forms of these edges. So in this example, it's just L3, L4, L5. And the denominator of the barycentric points, you all have the same denominator and that's the adjoint. So that's how Vasquez defined these coordinates. And then you have a nice normalization constant yeah, because you just wanted the barycentric coordinates to sum to one. So that's uh, the natural thing. Well, this, sorry, th this does look uh, quite a bit like the construction for the isosahedron. Um, the, if you, anyway, I, I, I won't uh, distract, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's very nice. <laughs> yes. Using cross ratios. It's, uh, exactly. I think one should uh, explore this a little bit more. It would also be interesting to see. Uh, like I think the, also the construction here is like similar for polytopes, so it was like the same, the same. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. And any simple polytope should have such a construction. Exactly. At least, yeah, yeah. Right. So the thing is also I find this so nice because so as I said, so Vaxpress, he was like really like doing this all by himself. Like he didn't know anything about anything of this. You know, I mean, he was just this geometric modeling person. And he really wanted to, to work with this. And um, yeah. And so actually, he only defined this for the polygons in the plane. And then someone else called Joe Warren picked this up in the 90s and actually generalized these coordinates to polytopes. So that was done for the first time in the 90s. And he was also a geometric modeling person um, that was interested solely for the purpose of barycentric coordinates. And then he ended up 
uh, working at Pixar also. So he was like the head of the geometric modeling at uh, Pixar actually. So these box plus coordinates were used in lots of animation films in the end. So yeah, very, very applied and very cool. And yeah, so the point is that these construction as you see here, and there's also a similar one that works for uh, a certain class called regular polypoles. But my point is somehow, the, is that the adjoint appears here in the denominator. And what I said on the previous slide is that Buxpress and the other geometric modeling people live on coordinates that are well defined on the interior of your object. But that means that this adjoint polynomial should not vanish in the interior of this object. And that's actually this big conjecture that I want to advertise. So Buxpress conjecture says, uh, I haven't defined what regular is, but that for regular polypoles in the plane that the adjoint curve does not pass through the interior. So it's polynomial doesn't have zeros. And so this conjecture is super important because otherwise these very central coordinates are not well defined. So, and it's very widely open. So let me tell you what this regularity means. So, so, so in particular, do they have a fixed sign? Are they all positive or something? Or, I mean, they're... Uh, yes, the adjoint will be then all positive on the interiors. That's what, what you then typically want to pick, yeah? Because you want the very center coordinates all to be positive. Yeah, so that was one of the things in this uh, Axiom catalog. Here, point A says that all very centric coordinates should be positive on the interior. Exactly. So the, uh, this, this, this mysterious word regular here is a word that Buxpress use. I know it's a very overused word in algebraic geometry and lots of other fields, but uh, yeah, just, um, how it is, is essentially a generalization of convexity. Um, because you want to study non-convex objects if you are interested in semi-algebraic sets that are bounded by curvy things, right? Um, so convex is not the correct notion anymore to study when you do polypole theory. But regularity will be the more or less natural uh, generalization. And I think it's also relevant to positive geometries. So in any case, so let me define it formally. So if we have now our rational polypole, which is defined now by real curves with real vertices, if I'm really in a real situation, um, then I can think of the sides or faces of such a polypole, right? And these are now the purple segments. So they are now real segments on the boundary curves that connect the vertices. And the union of these sides bounds this yellow simply connected region. And I will write P greater equals zero to distinguish that one from the more abstract notion of polypole that we had before. And so Vax was called such a polypole regular if two things happen. First of all, all points on these faces, on these sides, on these purple guys should be smooth, except the vertices. The vertices will obviously never be smooth because you have intersections, uh, but all other points should be smooth. And secondly, uh, no boundary curve should pass through the interior of the yellow region. And using this definition, it's, you can more or less easily see that a polygon is regular if and only if it's convex. And here in this picture down there in the bottom, you see what is wrong. So here we have a polygon that's not convex. And then you see that two of the boundary lines, they will automatically pass through the interior of such a polygon. And that's, that's a problem. Okay, so then that sense regularity is really like a natural generalization of convexity to these polypoles in the plane. And now you know the conjecture and I encourage everybody to go ahead and solve it. <laughs> it's very, very difficult at least. Yeah, I thought about it for a little bit. I don't know how to exactly do it. So Vaxpress knew this, um, that this conjecture is true for polygons. So there his coordinates made sense and 
everything is very happy. And so to get a better feeling of it, we also studied this uh, conjecture for polygons anyways. And we could see a little bit more than Bach squares, namely that these curves are nice and hyperbolic. And I'm not gonna go into the details now. I'm not sure how interesting it is with this audience here, but you can, like, hyperbolic means that uh, the real locus of your curve consists of a bunch of nested ovals. And we can exactly describe what these ovals are and where they come from. And it's actually very neat if you think of, you have a polygon, neighboring edges will meet in a vertex. Now if you consider two edges that are almost neighbors, you know, but they're not neighbors because there's two vertices in between. So you consider all edges at distance one, I guess. Um, their intersection points, they, through, they, uh, through those will the first oval pass. And then you continue. So the ith oval of this nested oval will pass to the intersection points of edges uh, of distance i plus one, where I forgot how you call distances exactly here, but uh, yeah. So it's really like the further apart somehow the edges on your polygon are, that will give you the, the different nested ovals. And so this makes perfectly sense if you have a polygon with an odd number of vertices. And if you have a polygon with an even number of vertices, then you also get like a nice pseudo line, which is in some sense, you know, the last nested oval, though it's not really an oval. And that's then really, um, the pseudo line passes through the section points of opposite edges, right? So if you think of like, like here is this uh, octagon. So you have four pairs of opposite edges. So we get four intersection points that lie on this uh, pseudo line. So you can prove all this very formally, very nicely. And uh, then we thought about, oh, for, for polygons, these edge joints are hyperbolic. Is it true in higher dimensional polytopes? The answer is no. I haven't really defined for you what this is, but I just wanted to point out that it's not true anymore for higher dimensional polytopes. Um, sorry, and, um, can I ask you a question? Um, um, very nice pictures. So I wanted to ask, uh, there was a question from um, uh, from the audience from before, which I think it's relevant now. Um, do you have a nice description of the equations of this? Of this Excuse me, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you, but I don't see the chat. So someone writes in the chat, you have to. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, no, no worries. I, that's why I, I'm reporting the question. So um, they were asking whether there are some explicit equations describing these adjoints that in principle, of course, you can, you, there are, I mean, in, you define them, but is there a nice uh, general description of the equations of these adjoints, uh, maybe for polygons or polypoles, um, or is it kind of yeah, so or for, for polygons and polytopes, so for linear objects, it's very it's easy. So actually this uh, Joe Warren guy, uh, who ended up at Pixar later, as I said, he was not an algebraic geometer either. He did not give an, he did not give a definition at all that looks too similar to what I talk now. I talked about the minimal curve passing through nice points, which algebraic geometers like a lot. But this Joe Warren guy actually defined it by giving a formula. And I mean, what he essentially did is like you triangulate the polytope and then you write down the correct formula. It looks very technical. And then you show that this formula is independent of the triangulation. But it's very efficient to compute from any sort of triangulation of a, of a polytope. The thing is though that I don't think there is a nice similar approach if you have these polypoles. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's not really clear if you would triangulate a polypole, what would really be the maybe, what, what is really the most elementary yeah. version of a triangle, right? That's the yeah. issue. I mean, it, it, it seems like, I mean, the, the special thing about uh, polygons is, is that they're regular. I mean, the subdivision is a regular triangulation induced via height function. So did, did you think, could that be a condition, regular subdivisions of, or triangulations of uh, polytopes in higher dimensions? Is that, could that be a condition that makes it uh, nice? I don't know, because I think, I mean, the only thing if I remember this Warren paper is that he said, take any triangulation of the polytope, but it should be a triangulation that only uses the vertices, that doesn't introduce any new vertices. And then it just works. So that's all somehow, I don't know. Um, I think 
Yeah, I mean, if I, I can show you the formula, uh, I don't have it in these slides, but I could uh, show it in the paper or something. Like, uh, yeah, but essentially, I mean, you, it's like a formula, it's like a weighted sum of the syntheses. Um, and then you end up with this adjoint. That sounds like the regular poly yeah. But yeah, I, yeah, I have to look at that. Thanks. Yeah, um, could, yeah. You share the, uh, could, you, could you share the reference at, at the end when, whenever you have time about this uh, formula that you were mentioning that there is an explicit formula for the adjoints in uh, some cases? Um, I mean, yes. Share it in mind. Okay. yes. Thank you. There okay. was also there was a, there was an Uber Wolfach workshop just last week or two weeks ago on uh, approximation theory and algebraic geometry. I wrote like a four pages abstract that contains the formula. It's really just four pages, and uh, I, okay. I think I can. I think you wouldn't mind if I send that to you. Oh, sure. And it okay. contains. Thank you very much. Yes, great. So let's see. So if you want to, if you're interested in this Waxbus contract, the first case where it's not known is polypoles bounded by three conics. It's really elementary and we really thought about it. Well, we didn't think about it for years, but we thought about it for half a year. And we really tried to, to prove it uh, for half a year. Um, and we were not really successful. So what we actually ended up doing, it's not what we wanted to do, but what we did is we showed that there is in fact 44 topologically non-equivalent configurations of three ellipses in the plane. Um, that define polypoles. With defining polypoles, I mean that your three ellipses should uh, um, meet in at least two real points pairwise, and they should meet transversely. And uh, the three ellipses should not meet all together in the same point. And so, under these reasonable assumptions, there is 44 topologically non equivalent configurations of three real ellipses. And we studied all 44 of them. And we managed to show that the Vaxpass conjecture was post 33. So there was still 11 guys left that we don't really know what to do. And so somehow the issue is that in 28 of these configurations, the adjoint curve will always be hyperbolic, as you see on these two pictures uh, on the left. And then it's very easy, well, it's not very easy, but it's reasonable to prove Vaxpass conjecture that the edge run stays outside of the yellow region. But then there is, as I said, for 28, that's only true with the hyperbolicity. And then for all the others, it's not true. So you see an example there on the right. And then we did a very specialized argument that we could like, you know, we could take five of five more configurations and prove max plus conjecture for those. But it's, I mean, and then we were like, oh, what are we doing now? Are we now looking at one by one at each of the 11 remaining guys and try to write down five pages of proof for each of them? So I don't, I'm not really sure if that's the right approach that we ended up um, doing. But um, also, actually, Vaxpas's grandson wrote his um, uh, bachelor thesis or senior thesis in Princeton on this problem. Very, and also attempted to, to prove it, but didn't manage. So that's all I wanted to say about this conjecture and hope that you're interested. And now I want to finally spend uh, some minutes on the positive geometry parts. That is that I think many here will be more familiar with this than I am, but uh, also to fix notation, I want to repeat the definition. If there's not a question anymore, what is first part? the Vax plus barycentric coordinates and uh, conjecture. Good, then we will now, um, you know, we take a fresh breath and uh, our setting is now, we start from scratch more or less. So we have like a nice ambient variety X. Nice here means projective complex irreducible of dimension N. Um, so a very concrete variety. And we are again studying semi-algebraic sets. Now we have a semi-algebraic subset of the real part of this ambient variety. And the semi-algebraic subset should be closed and non-empty. And it should be also nice uh, in the sense that uh, if I consider its interior, 
Euclidean interior. This should be an open oriented uh, manifold of dimension n. And if I take the closure of the interior, I get the setback. I mean, this just means that, uh, I mean, if you're in the plane, for instance, you don't want like a triangle and like a point somewhere or something, because if you take the interior and the closure back, you would lose the point. Uh, so that's the setting. Um, then I write this uh, partial x greater or equal zero symbol is for me the Euclidean boundary of the symmetric set. And we're also going to study the Zariski closure of the Euclidean boundary, where I just write partial x. Um, and uh, so in the picture on the right, this is three lines. And I want to already go with the analogy to the pol to polypoles. So this the risk closure of the boundary is going to have several reducible components, our boundary hypersurfaces in general. Right. And this positive geometry definition, as you know, is like a recursive one. Um, so we need to understand for each boundary um, hypersurface, we need to understand which part of it is actually on the boundary. And that's what this is, ci greater or equal zero is. So you just consider the ith boundary hypersurface, you intersect it with the actual semi algebraic subset. Um, and that's kind of the actual boundary part. But again, you want to take, get rid of like lower dimensional superfluous parts of that. So you take the interior closure. This is, for instance, relevant if you consider like a non convex polygon. Uh, as on the previous slide. Maybe if I draw a picture, uh, if you have a polygon like this, uh, then this edge, you know, the boundary part I want to consider is only this one. I don't want to consider this point over there. Right. Okay, and now we can finally give this definition of what is a positive geometry. So now we have this pair of the ambient variety X and the semi algebraic subset inside of it, and we call it a positive geometry if there is a unique non zero rational n form on it, satisfying the properties um, that this form is called the canonical form. And as I said, it's kind of recursive. So, first of all, if our ambient dimension would be zero, so meaning we're just working with a point here, then this canonical form should be plus or minus one, depending on the orientation of the point. And otherwise, if we are in positive dimensions, then every boundary component should be also a positive geometry with the property that the re residue of the canonical form along the boundary hypersurface is just the canonical form of this boundary part. So somehow like a recursive natural restriction idea here. And then like a small technical thing I like to add, it's not really written in all the papers, but I think it should be that you kind of want this uh, canonical form to be holomorphic everywhere else. If I'm saying something wrong, please correct me. <laughs> As I said, there's more people that might know this better than I do, since I only studied this once, so. Right. And so we were interested in like understanding baby examples of these positive geometries. And uh, so this is well known. And I think you've seen this maybe in other seminar talks. What happens if your ambient dimension is zero, you just have a point. What happens if your ambient dimension is one? Well, then you can actually see this ambient curve has to be rational in this case. And so this is uh, a very important and it ties back to that Buxpress also only studied rational curves. Um, why is this curve having to be rational? Because this canonical form should be unique. And that means essentially that you don't want any non-zero uh, holomorphic N forms on your ambient variety X. And the only curves uh, that have this property are the genus zero ones. So X has to be a rational curve. 
And that means that your semi-algebraic subsets um, has to lie in a rational curve and in fact has to be the union of closed intervals. So that's the only choice you have. And also every such union is a positive geometry and it's like kind of easy to compute what this canonical form should be. So if you have this nice interval from A to B, uh, for instance, uh, that's the canonical form. And then I'm just going to go through this very quickly because you know all of these other examples of positive geometries are the totally non-negative Grassmannian, and then conjecturally the amplitudehedron, right, or more generally any Grassmann polytope, which is the image of the totally non-negative Grassmannian under a linear map. And for the amplitudehedron, it's like uh, for special linear maps. I mean, I didn't make new slides for this talk. I made the talk I just because of parental leave. I gave it to people that didn't know anything about amplitudehedrons, amplitudehedra, I guess. But I want to get back to problems in the plane, and that's like the last slide here. Um, so, in this, as far as I understand, in this positive geometry story, it's, it's an interesting problem to find formulas for this canonical form, and maybe to understand what they look like. And I just told you in the one dimensional geometries, they are units of intervals on rational curves. And now what happens for two dimensional ones? Um, maybe that's difficult to understand. So what we did is maybe first understand those that are lying in the plane where the ambient space is not just two dimensional but actually the plane. So if I have a positive geometry in the plane, then by this recursive definition, we know that all the boundary curves have to be rational curves. And that means that more or less, this positive geometry is a rational polypole as Baxter's wanted it. But a slight generalization of it, I will say something about in what, in what sense they are more general in the next slide. But there is not a big difference between these two classes, between positive geometries and um, these uh, rational polypoles, I would say. And also vice versa, when you have a rational polypole, it's a positive geometry. And then I can also tell you the, the formula for this canonical form. Yeah, so the theorem says rational polypoles are positive geometries. And in fact, the canonical form looks like this. Like the numerator of it is again, alpha, which is here the defining equation of the adjoint. So alpha defining equation of the adjoint and the numerator is not surprisingly just the product of the defining equations of the boundary curves. And then you have to normalize this rational function properly such that uh, you get plus minus one at the vertices. Okay, and so I think you know, I mean, there, that this, is, uh, this formula was observed before for polytopes, uh, as far as I know, but Christian gets at least uh, that's uh, in some lecture notes that I found. So yeah, it's, I think, very cool. And so we essentially just did the same formula for these curvy objects, which requires slightly different proof techniques. Yeah, and then I want to finish just with saying that uh, positive geometries, as I said, are slightly more general than polypoles, and I want to say how they are different. And um, there is essentially two ways how they can be different. There is also this class of positive geometries in the plane that just have one boundary curve. They were excluded from Vaxpa's definition of polypoles because the definition started with, let's take at least two boundary curves. Um, but if you have just one boundary curve, I think they should also in some sense be polypoles uh, because you get one vertex, the green one, and all your other singularities are going to be residual points and you can show that there is a unique adjoint passing through these uh, residual points actually. And it's the same story with the same canonical form that it's just the adjoint divided by the defining equation of the curve. And the other way how positive geometries can be different from polypoles is that in the polypole setting, I really thought of like polygons. 
you have cyclically ordered edges and vertices. And every edge just corresponds to one boundary piece. But that's not required in the poly positive geometry definition. So here in this example, we have a region with four vertices, but only two boundary curves, because each boundary curve contributes to two faces, you see? And so this was excluded in this polypole definition. And also now it's actually uh, a little bit of a different story because there is not a unique edge joint anymore. And I find this very fascinating and that will kind of want to end at this because um, why do I find this fascinating? Because actually uh, you can still think about residual points. In this example, the set of residual points is empty by the way. And you can still think of curves of the correct degree that vanish at these points. Here in this case, I want to think of lines that pass through the empty set. So every line would be an adjoint. Um, but what is somehow happening is that there was like infinitely many adjoints for these guys, but the canonical form actually picks out a unique one by this recursive construction and uh, that you want the correct thing to happen at the vertices. So it's actually true, and we also have it as a proposition that the adjoint of the canonical form still satisfies the property of an adjoint. It's just interesting that there is not a unique adjoint anymore. Right, and I think that's somehow the main difference between positive geometries and polypoles. Yes, and I think I want to end here. Uh, yeah, so, and what happens in 3D? How when can, other open question, how can you define polypoles in 3D? And how can you classify positive geometries in 3D? I think is a open problem. Here's some examples. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kathleen. Let's uh, let's thank the speaker. It was a little uh, faster than, than I know. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. I, I think it was uh, it was great. Um, I mean, for sure, for sure. Um, I have some questions, and some people in the audience have questions. Um, so we can, um, yeah. First of all, uh, since the schedule is a bit unusual, uh, feel free to leave if you have, if you have other duties. But um, we're staying here like for other 10, 15 minutes, according to your availability to ask some more questions. Um, and just before passing to the questions the part, um, just wanted to say that uh, um, next week, the uh, seminar again will be, they will be hybrid. Um, and uh, yeah, so see you next week for who has to leave now and we can start to ask some questions. Um, is there anyone with, does everyone have any questions? May I ask one? Sure. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for uh, the nice talk. Uh, what I was wondering about is uh, probably the simplest case uh, to which you have already, might have already given the answer. Uh, when you look at the associated row, then you talk about the notion of a joint curve. Uh, I'm just wondering if that joint curve remains tractable if you slightly uh, deform the sociohedra and uh, um, like somehow uh, <clears throat> in, like imprecisely referring to the notion of generalized sociohedra because for the generalized sociohedra at least the way that we thought about it was like you start moving the facets as long as possible not to introduce new singularities but uh, when you when you start from a given associated row and you find out what the joint curve is, if you change the facets slightly and think about the generalized associated row, is the uh, joint curve still tractable? So my wild guess would be yes, but uh, I think it. Um... Yeah, I mean, this would require some formal proof. Yeah, that might not be necessarily easy. I mean, I mean, the only thing when I was when I was studying polytopes, which are much easier than associator, there is true that if you have a polytope and you 
deform it and you do perturbations to it and then you would also consider a little bit back so the so there we could give very formal proofs that these edge joints are well behaved under taking limits um, and perturbations um, but uh, please uh, yeah, my, my quick uh, follow up question was Does that imply that if you uh, prove the conjecture uh, for, let's say, one particular setting and you keep track of the uh, adjointer, does that imply at least the case that you studied? Would that imply that you can verify the conjecture for the perturbed uh, polygon? It might be, it was definitely one of the things how we were, uh, one of the proof strategies that we were thinking how one could otherwise try to attempt this, um, proving that the edge range stays outside. But we had some technical difficulties that we somehow ran into, which I don't recall at the moment, but I think it should be in principle possible, yeah? I'm not sure if we didn't just follow it through to the end, so to say, or... And, and if you could kindly mention which work you're referring to when you said you discussed this, that would be probably my last uh, question. Uh, yeah, so of course, it, you don't have yes, to I mention it send, right uh, I will send uh, to Matteo this four-page summary, which contains almost everything that I talked to you a little bit and even a little bit more about the polytope story. And so we did this work on these three conics and deformations and so on uh, in this paper with this many authors. So it's going to be in the references. And I think it's called like air joints and canonical forms of rational polypodes. But uh, it will be in the references. It's the many authored paper. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks a lot. I wanted to ask, like you were mentioning, you were mentioning about a survey, right? Like which contains the applications to finite element methods. I kind of missed it. Can you also send it to us? Like I yes, want. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you.